about that. Well, hello everyone. My name is Dr. Kevin O'Neill, and I would like to welcome you to this session entitled Leveraging Improved Vaccine Technology and the Healthcare Team to Protect Older Adults. I will be the moderator, and I have no commercial relationships to disclose. We have a distinguished panel with us today, and I will introduce each of them prior to their presentation. I'll start by giving a brief overview of the status of adult immunization rates in the United States and how this compares with the Healthy People 2020 goals, which is the national initiative of the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. Our speakers will then discuss the improvements in vaccine, vaccine technology and effectiveness, the research around the emerging benefits of vaccination, and how we can practically improve immunization rates in older adults. This program was initially presented last November at the annual meeting of the Gerontologic Society of America in Boston. So we are continuing the conversation as part of the momentum discussion. We thank Securus for their support of this educational program. So we'll go to slide six and what you'll see here is that adult vaccination rates remain unacceptably low in the United States. We are far below national targets, which means that millions of Americans are susceptible for vac vaccine preventable illnesses. The estimated cost to our healthcare system is about $10 billion every year. On slide seven, this table shows recent data related to adult vaccinations and where we are compared to the Healthy People 2020 goals. I won't go into too much detail here, but I was especially struck by the number of high-risk persons who have not been immunized, and I was very dismayed to see the low rate of immunizations among healthcare personnel. I am pleased that we are seeing more and more healthcare organizations including those in post-acute and the long-term care world, moving to mandatory staff immunizations. Slide number eight, as this slide suggests, we can make time to get vaccinated or we can make time for illness. So let's just do it. Let's get our patients, our families, our friends and colleagues to do it as well. On slide number nine, in order to increase vaccination rates, we need to know and address the barriers, which I've outlined here. There are so many myths around vaccines that we need to dispel. I think the anti-vaccine movement has done a lot of damage. Interestingly, I met a young Navy doctor who was in his last year of a family medicine residency when I was flying to North Carolina last week. He had a great success in his career by not using the word vaccine or vaccination. He tells his patients that he has given them an immunization to build their body's defense and prevent a specific disease. So maybe just changing our words may help. Organizations that provide the vaccines to no cost to the individual and provide on-site clinics generally have better immunization rates as well. Slides 10 and 11, the tables here reference are references for you for the big five older adult immunizations. The second table shows the recommended schedule based on medical condition and the other indications. So you can refer to that at your convenience. Slide number 12, as this cartoon depicts, Influenza is not desirable. No, this patient may not be influential. Our panel certainly is. So I will introduce our first speaker, Dr. Janet McElhaney. Dr. McElhaney received her medical degree with honors from the University of Alberta, Faculty of Medicine, followed by a residency in internal medicine and fellowship in geriatric medicine. She has served in various positions at East Virginia Medical School and the University of Connecticut Health, Health Science Center, where she continues to hold an appointment in the Center on Aging and Department of Immunology. Dr. McElhaney is currently the Health Sciences North Volunteer Association Chair in Healthy Aging and the Vice President Research and Scientific Director of the Health Sciences North Research Institute in Sudbury, Ontario. She has received numerous prizes and awards in her career, including the Clinical Medicine Research Award from the Gerontologic Society of America. Dr. McElhinney will discuss improving vaccine effectiveness in older adults and older adults and advances in vaccine technology. Welcome, Dr. McElhinney. Thank you, um, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction. So I'm gonna start off today on this uh, first slide talking about the name of my research program for the last probably about 20 years. Um, and this is called VITALITY. I'm known for my acronyms. This stands for the Vaccine Initiative to Add Life to Years. And this is to recognize the changing role of vaccines as we age, have more chronic diseases, and understanding that our immune systems weaken. So our immune responses to vaccination are not always as robust as they were when we were younger. 
Um, but we uh, also know that um, what we're trying to do is instead of focusing on preventing diseases when that doesn't happen, how can we do things that add life to years? And that means preventing the serious complications of influenza or any infection uh, as a vaccine preventable uh, disability. Uh, I want to acknowledge the support of the National Institutes of Health, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, and our Canadian Immunization Research Network um, that relates to my disclosures on uh, slide two that represent my collaboration with the vaccine industry to try and develop more effective vaccines for older adults. On uh, slide three, I, this is um, recognizing all those things that I, I talked about. In addition to weakening of the immune system as we age, we refer to this as immune senescence. But um, we now know that this is only part of the story in terms of our susceptibility to influenza and, and pneumonias. Um, chronic diseases like diabetes and heart and lung diseases as well as poor diets, obesity, smoking, and sedentary lifestyles all contribute to risk for poor responses to these vaccines, but also um, significant complications. And all of these are directly implicated in the functional decline that uh, follows um, infectious illnesses, especially if you're hospitalized. Um, so that when we look at this, um, all of these different factors that I've shown on this slide, um, it relates to this whole concept of, of frailty, which is a loss of our ability to uh, uh, respond to acute um, health stressors like uh, a, a viral illness. Um, the, and so what I want people to understand from this slide is that this all uh, contributes to frailty, which means that your ability to respond to acute health stressors, so if I can put this into the context of known risk factors, if you've been previously hospitalized for influenza or, and pneumo or pneumonia, um, you actually have more risk uh, on a scale of, of looking at risk for hospitalization and death due to influenza. You get more points on that scale if you've had a previous hospitalization for this compared to somebody that's over the age of 90. I think that really puts this into context around the importance of um, uh, uh, chronic diseases. And uh, so this is really what we're talking about. To go to the next slide, um, this is now illustrating that whole frailty index that I talked about on, on the previous slide. And so while we are on this steepest part of the curve in terms of functional decline and loss of this resilience as we age, you can see that out in the community we all look the same like those stick figures out there. Um, but it's not until we're relying on the, on the structure in the uh, emergency department and the, the staff are, and physicians are talking to us like we just were tr uh, have come in from a nursing home. Um, they don't recognize our potential for recovery and uh, return to the life that we had previously enjoyed. Um, influenza illness significantly impacts on this, and we know that vaccination reduces your risk of this happening. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, uh, we know that in the case of influenza, 15% of older adults hospitalized with influ influenza will experience what we call catastrophic disability. So this is not only just um, your risk of, of not being able to actually return to those previous activities that you enjoyed, uh, but also uh, catastrophic disability means that you've lost uh, more than two of your basic self-care activities. Um, these are things like bathing, toileting, and just walking around your home. Um, these are the things that um, have a significant impact and get to people's worst fear about coming into a hospital is becoming more dependent on your families or having to go to a nursing home after discharge from hospital. Um, that's what catastrophic disability um, means to an older person. Um, and we also know that this predicts very high mortality rates in the year following that hospital admission. So. Um, and the reason why this happens is that you come into hospital, that usual aging older person, 
um, puts you into a hospital bed where you're going to lose 5% of your functional muscle strength every day you spend in bed, and you go out of hospital looking like that frail stick figure that I showed you in the previous diagram. And most people never recover from that, even after hospital discharge. Um, so this is really um, the whole point of this, is that our underlying chronic diseases and the related inflammation um, that Dr. Gravenstein will talk about in his, in his presentation, um, the whole thing around flu causing strokes, heart failure, pneumonia, ischemic heart disease, and cancer, um, as well as hip fractures, are really related to not just the influenza illness itself, but this kind of geriatric giant of chronic diseases in terms of risk for catastrophic disability. Uh, the next slide. So um, this is a picture of the influenza virus, and all I want to point out for this, if you can just go back to the previous slide, um, just to point out that all of our current vaccines are really um, pointed at trying to generate an antibody response to the surface glycoprotein hemagglutinin, and it just to the very tip of that, of that molecule. Um, and this is, um, the problem with this is that if we get the wrong strain for whatever reason, we have completely lost protection mediated by that vaccine. Uh, whereas if we look at other parts of this virus uh, um, uh, molecule, uh, this is, um, we now are looking to other parts of the immune system that can be stimulated to kill that uh, virus infected cell. Next slide. So this is just showing you how vaccines work. We get vaccinated, those antigen presenting cells, those white ones in the middle, take that vaccine back to the lymph nodes where we have T helper cells that are going to stimulate those B cells to produce the antibodies that I just talked about. But in addition, our current vaccines are very poor at um, stimulating those cytotoxic T lymphocytes there um, because of they, they really are responding to a virus infection and going out and killing those virus infected cells. So when we're developing new vaccines, you can advance the slide, you're going to see that we, when we're looking at new vaccines, we not only want antibodies, we also want these um, killer T cells, the kind of soldiers of clearing the virus from the lungs. Uh, advance the slide. So you see you get a virus infection. Most of us, um, when we're younger, we have a lot of barrier defenses around preventing that virus from getting into the cell. Um, and once inside the cell to try and slow down the rate of virus replication. All of those mechanisms are, are a decline with aging. And so we want to have um, something that will um, come in and, and be ready to go in terms of fighting that infection. It can hit the, the advance the slide again. And so you can see that once those viruses get inside the cells, the antibodies can only bind what's outside of the virus. So as soon as that vir as soon as that cell turns into this factory for viral replication, the antibodies can't keep up with the rate of virus release. Advance the slide. What this does is it triggers a response with aging that actually suppresses the, the ability of those cytotoxic T lymphocytes to come in. And so advance the slide. Uh, so what we're trying to do is get, um, and so what happened is in all of this, another cell became infected there, advance the slide again. So what we're trying to do with new vaccines is get it to target to go in this direction so that advance the slide, um, we have these cytotoxic T lymphocytes coming in and they can kill that virus infected cell without damaging the rest of the lung tissue. Um, next, uh, advance the slide. And so you can see these little granules crossing over to make that happen. So it's like little bullets uh, going in to kill that cell. Next slide. So what I'm really talking about is finding your resilience, keeping your glass half full means that everything that we can do to prevent those changes that happen with age, uh, accumulation of chronic diseases, and weakening of the immune system, we can keep finding ways to keep your glass half full. And vaccination is a key uh, component of this. And so what I say to people is, after I've given you all of this information, 
Are you really willing to stand your ground on a decision not to get vaccinated and risk your independence this uh, winter? Um, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. McElhaney. Our next speaker is Dr. Stefan Grafenstein, and although he cannot be with us in person today, he has kindly recorded his talk for us. Dr. Gravenstein is an academic and clinical geriatrician, currently serving as professor in the Division of Geriatrics and Palliative Care in the Department of Medicine at Brown University. He is also active with the Providence Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Dr. Gravenstein was a member of the Infectious Disease Society of America's Influenza Guidelines Committee and an author of the Endenberg Center for Health Sciences publication, Optimizing the Prevention of Herpes Zoster in Older Adults. He routinely speaks at medical grand rounds and other lectures about influenza vaccine. He understands the practical implications of vaccine recommendations and has been working with quality improvement projects to change the behavior of individuals and institutions specific to vaccine. So thank you, Dr. Gravenstein. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so yes, I'll be talking about um, influenza and the goal here is to to think about influenza more than just a targeted condition for a vaccine, um, where all you can do is prevent influenza, you're actually preventing all the downstream consequences of influenza too. So um, I have a couple of disclosures. I have been on advisory boards and received honoraria from uh, Sanofi, Aventis, and Sakiris in the last year. Um, and um, I am a principal investigator for grants that are funded by Sanofi uh, and Securus, both manufacturers of influenza vaccine. So I'm going to give you a little context um, about infection and outcomes and this risk of inflammatory outcomes, as you'll hear me call it, that result in strokes and heart attacks, um, how this is influenced by age and disease, and how we can influence outcomes by infection prevention such as with influenza vaccine. A good place to start from this is uh, one of my favorite papers that made me think about this in a different way it was published by Spieth back in 2004 in the New England Journal. And in this uh, work, they were looking at the Medicare population and looked at first heart attacks and first strokes occurring after infection. So in this, you can see a red box where systemic respiratory tract infections and urinary tract infections are listed. In these two lines, uh, you can see in the first two weeks, uh, the first month, the first three months following a respiratory tract infection or a bladder infection, the risk for having a, a first ever heart attack is increased by 1.6 to 3.8 fold. And the tail on that risk is out to three months. So not just right at the time of infection, but also for a time afterwards, you might still have things happening in your lungs causing inflammation. So you have this tail uh, risk of following an infection of having a first ever heart attack. In the bottom part, this is following a respiratory tract infection or bladder infection, first ever stroke. There's also a tail. This is two to three fold increase with a increased risk for that first ever stroke occurring as far out as three months. If you look at the paper, you could see that this isn't just in people having first time events, people who had prior heart attacks or strokes also have a similarly increased risk. That risk doesn't increase following vaccination, it increases following infection. So um, when I try to explain what's going on here to my learners, um, I have devised this uh, graphic, which I call a thrombo meter. And um, the way I think about this is when you have inflammation that's produced by infection, that inflammation increases these uh, acute phase reactants that also promote clotting. And if that clot occurs in your heart, it's a heart attack in your brain, it's a stroke. If it's in one of the veins in your legs, deep veins or elsewhere, it's called a deep venous thrombosis and so forth. And as these inflammatory mediators increase, your risk for delirium increases and the risk for subsequent downstream dementia also appears to increase. So just by virtue of getting older, uh, so this is the very 
first thing here, and you can see the thrombometer now ticking up, that C-reactive protein, helicobacter 6, TNF-alpha, and other cytokines also begin to increase as markers of inflammation. So just with aging, pure aging alone, these things start going up. You add to that uh, diseases, obesity, diabetes, uh, uh, emphysema, and so forth, these markers go up even further, and you can see the thrombometer ticking up even farther, and the propensity to clot is even greater. Now you add to that, for a trifecta, infections, such as influenza, pneumonia, shingles, bladder infection, pressure sores, they kick it up also, and it's especially high acutely after the infection until it clears, and then it starts dropping back down again. So that propensity to clot is greatest in the time that immediately follows the infection, sort of as I teach it with this thrombometer. So um, when we talk about this, you can see in the top left, influenza virus infection or some other infection. It kicks up protein C and S, serum amyloid A, cytokines, and so forth. All of those uh, promote uh, thrombogenesis, potentially emboli. Uh, you may have atherosclerosis without underlying atherosclerosis. The risk of having that acute MI is smaller. So if you're young and have clean coronaries, you're not as likely to get this outcome. But if you're in the older group, uh, you're uniquely at increased risk for that first ever or subsequent heart attack or stroke. So um, there are several articles out there, and this is just a few examples, where influenza specifically can cause heart attacks and strokes. Um, of the one of the more recent ones, ones uh, Dr. Kwong from Toronto, uh, studied some uh, 19,000 of the 277,000 respiratory virus tests. Of this group of 19,000 that tested positive for flu, uh, almost 500 were hospitalized for a heart attack. 332 of them had influenza in the week before. And their risk for having a heart attack in the week following flu, as opposed to before, was six-fold higher. So it was also higher after other virus infections like RSV, about three-fold higher. So this was a uh, elegantly designed study to specifically describe this increased risk for a thrombotic outcome like AMI following influenza infection. There was also a time series study uh, for AMI uh, and stroke done by Blackburn. And again, uh, they showed uh, respiratory viruses associated with heart attacks and strokes for the group older than age 75. And there was a 0.4% to 5.7% risk of heart attack and stroke emissions attributable to respiratory virus infection in general. So uh, when you think about this outcome of heart attack or stroke, that's a pretty severe outcome. Um, all of you have had influenza in your lifetime, and you can imagine that in your case, you probably didn't have a heart attack or stroke. So what's all the stuff in between having a heart attack and stroke and having full recovery? So we hypothesize that you can measure this in a nursing home setting where people are at risk for having all the intermediate outcomes, perhaps in a measurable way. And the way we proposed to measure it was in terms of the activities of daily living. Now, um, when we talk about activities of daily living in the nursing home, we talk about this as seven specific functions, dressing, bathing, eating, toileting, transferring, bed mobility, and locomotion. And these are scored in every nursing home re resident at least every quarter um, as being uh, either a score of zero, which would be completely independent in each of these activities, or a summary score of up to four per any one of these seven items, uh, where one would be independent or needing supervision, uh, independent but needing some supervision, limited assistance, extensive assistance, or complete dependence, which would score four. So your maximum score would be seven point four or 28. So we hypothesize that uh, the intermediate outcomes where uh, up on this graph is worse and down on this graph is better, and the blue line is activities of day living, um, where if you uh, were in a nursing home during the peak of influenza season, you may have worsening of activities of daily living, and uh, off-season, the population as a whole would have better activity of daily living function. So this wouldn't be specific heart attacks or strokes. It's just uh, how much help do you need to do those independent activities. And in this graph, you can see over the time we measured from 99 to 2005, where we 
uh, cross-linked data in over 2,000 nursing homes across the country with their activities of daily living as reported in the minimum data set, to severity of influenza based on influenza mortality at the city level. So these 2,200 nursing homes were um, in the cities that were dependent, uh, reporting influenza mortality. And you can see that the up in the red line in terms of mortality is worse. Also, the ADL is at its uh, scores at its highest, meaning worst ADL function. And this map uh, you know, moves in lockstep with influenza severity. Even the downward trend in overall influenza mortality as flu vaccine uptake has grown, you can see there's a downward trend in that uh, maximum ADL score each flu season. So um, influenza can lead to heart attack or stroke, but if we give them an influenza vaccine, can we prevent a heart attack or stroke? There are now several observational studies that indicate that standard flu vaccines can reduce the heart, risk of heart attack or stroke. And the Cochrane Review um, says that this evidence is best with underlying cardiovascular disease. The, the strength of this evidence is better for heart failure and heart attack than stroke specifically because it's a more common event. And the prevention effect sizes have varied from 15 to 45 percent for uh, heart attack and for this combined endpoint of cardiovascular events, which we call MACE. Um, there's a less clear effect size on this enic stroke by itself. So uh, there's a nice review of this done by McIntyre in 2016. Um, Verizon uh, uh, reported on the estimated efficacy of vaccine preventing AMI. That ranged from 15 to 45 percent, and I think the remarkable thing here is that this is in the same effect size as uh, uh, reducing the risk of a heart attack that you would get if you quit smoking, or you took a statin to lower your cholesterol, or you adhered to your antihypertensive therapy. So it's a it's one of the ways that I think about talking to my patients. It's not about preventing flu; it's about well, would you quit smoking? to um, uh, prevent a heart attack, then why wouldn't you take a flu shot once a year? Okay, so here's another study from Vamos and others in the Canadian uh, Medical Journal. Um, here you can see that in the first pair of lines, hospital admissions for acute MI during the influenza season, you can see that the risk for having that heart attack is less in the people who are uh, vaccinated and have diabetes. So this entire table is people who have, have diabetes. Uh, hospital admissions for stroke are also significantly less during the flu season. Heart failure also significantly less. And in each case, this effect size is uh, during flu season is in the ballpark of 15 to 25 percent, with all-cause death effect size of about a 48 percent uh, risk reduction. So the primary approach to influenza prevention is vaccinate, and then you get this secondary effect where uh, if you have people who live in a, in a close setting, you can potentially protect the others around them from getting infected, which is why we want healthcare workers vaccinated. And we want to vaccinate kids to keep from infecting their parents and grandparents. Um, and we can prevent secondary uh, complications, both in children and older adults and people with underlying disease, including these cardiovascular outcomes. So the vaccine response declines with age, and um, this uh, vaccine response also means that when we get infected with flu or pneumococcal disease or other infections, that our um, we get less protection from the vaccine and we're more likely to get more severe infections. Because a vaccine effect declines with age, there is an underlying question, can more um, immunogenic vaccines, we would call them enhanced vaccines, do even better at preventing these outcomes. So there's randomized controlled trials available in enhanced vaccines, and these include for high dose, with four times the antigen in the same vaccine volume. Uh, and there are now a couple of studies out there that indicate that there's a reduction both in laboratory confirmed influenza, also in relatively healthy elderly outpatients, some 32,000, and in nursing homes for being hospitalized in a population of about 38,000 in living in over 800 nursing homes. The first study was primarily in, with influenza A H3 and 2. The second one was primarily in a season where there was influenza A H1 in the one as the predominant circulating strains. With the adjuvanted vaccine, 
there is, uh, this is the same dose of antigen, but there's also an adjuvant in there that enhances the immune response. There's one uh, 52,000 uh, uh, nursing home plus randomized trial that we performed with folks over the age of 65. And this was in an AH3 and 2 uh, predominant year. And there was, again, a signal for reduced all-cause hospitalization in that study as reported last year at the uh, ID Week uh, conference. There's a recombinant vaccine, which is a triple dose, but it only uh, contains hemoglobin. And um, there is a 9,000 uh, patient population study with folks over the age of 50 years. This was outpatient, and it suggested there were 30% less laboratory confirmed influenza reports on reduced hospitalization, so that they're not out uh, yet. So the summary is that the regular vaccine reduces the risk for pneumonia, influenza, combined cardiovascular events with the best evidence for heart attacks and strokes, and it reduces uh, risk of mortality. For the enhanced vaccines, there are evidence for added benefit beyond just the regular vaccine, both immunologically and for flu outcomes. The bottom line here is vaccinate. Any vaccine is better than none, and enhanced vaccines can offer added advantage to older adults. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Jane will present on putting it into practice how to raise vaccination rates in older adults. Dr. Green currently serves as the Population Health Management Ambulatory Care Clinical Pharmacist and co-chair of the System Vaccine Subcommittee for Oxford Health System in New Orleans. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry and her PharmD her Farm degree from Xavier University, Louisiana, New Orleans. Uh, April joined Oxford in 2014 as an inpatient staff pharmacist at the Slidell Louisiana Hospital campus and later joined Oshner Main Campus located in New Orleans for her current role. As population health management pharmacist, she's responsible for assisting with efforts to improve their quality measure outcomes, increase vaccination rates in the pediatric and adult populations, increasing comprehensive medication reviews performed by pharmacists, and improving patients' medication adherence for the treatment of chronic health conditions. Welcome, Dr. Green. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I do have some new disclosures to um, report. I am now a certified um, speaker for Merck and Sanofi for uh, various vaccine products, which I do receive an honorarium for when my services are used. So why are adult vaccines important? Healthy People provides science-based 10-year national objectives for improving the health of all Americans. For three decades, Healthy People has established benchmarks and monitored progress over time in order to encourage collaborations across communities and sectors, to empower individuals towards making informed health decisions, and to measure the impact of prevention activities. These slot, this slot identifies the Healthy People 2020 immunization goals for adults on the five vaccines that we are targeting within our institution. Healthy People 2020 target goals for up-to-date HPV vaccination in females and males by the age of 13 to 15 years is 80%, and we adopted the goal internally for our adults up to the age of 26. One of the initial things our organization did to begin our journey of improving our immunization rates was the formation of the System Vaccine Subcommittee. It's a multidisciplinary team that meets monthly to address vaccine policies, procedures, concerns, or barriers in our clinics and hospitals. The team works to resolve these issues and reports that resolution outward so other locations can resolve in the same manner if encountered. The team accomplishments are reported out to System P&T quarterly. Knowing your rates is possibly the most essential step that can be taken to understand what shortcomings exist in your organization for adult vaccination. Most believe that they're doing a great job at closing this care gap, but find it's not the case once they are able to pull their rates. Nursing immunization standing orders is another strategy that can be used to broaden the list of vaccines ordered and administered by nurses to reduce wait times and lags in your clinics due to needing the provider to place the order. I do strongly recommend providing nursing vaccine education in your settings to increase nursing knowledge and confidence. Utilizing the reminder recall system is another strategy that can be used to help improve your immunization rates. 
Reminder recall is an evidence-based, widely recommended strategy that is proven to increase immunization rates in both adults and young children. Using reminder recall systems has been shown to improve not only immunization rates, but also overall health care. Um, immunization reminder and recall systems are simple and cost effective. They also improve your data in your immunization information system. Improving administration barriers with vaccinations is also another way to improve your adult vaccination efforts. Pharmacists reported cost to patient or concerns that insurance might not cover the cost of the vaccine as the most commonly expressed concern of adult patients regarding their vaccine administration in retail pharmacies. Very often, patients refuse to vaccinate in the pharmacy due to the copay associated with their vaccine. $40 for a vaccine may not seem like much to me or you, but for a patient on a restricted income, this could be the difference in getting groceries or putting gas in the car. If the vaccine is not covered by the patient's insurance plan, this may be a good opportunity to refer the patient to the local health care unit where vaccines can be obtained at a reasonable cost or look into vaccine patient assistant programs that are offered by pharma companies. The patient would be required to meet certain qualifications in order to get the vaccinated um, vaccinations through either of these programs. In order for any vaccination program to be successful, it is recommended that an administration area should be used and available that's convenient for the patient. Long transports or having to relocate the patient to be immunized could discourage the patient from being vaccinated. Also, having the vaccines recommended available in the clinic and the pharmacy is a must. We have to catch patients in that moment to close the gap on immunization. GSA's iCamp is an excellent resource to increase education and awareness of adult vaccinations for your vaccine champions. Getting the most out of your EHR through the utilization of immunization registries and dashboards is also a plus and participating with other IDSs around the country through collaboratives, work groups, or summits to learn what others are doing are just a few other ways that you can improve your vaccination efforts. This slide captures a few additional ways that we have attempted to continue to improve our vaccination efforts. Um, the state immunization registry is fed and pulled um, immunization information has been extremely helpful in keeping our patients' records up to date. Education with our clinic staff has proven to be the most valued in that it helps staff to develop the confidence that they need to make strong recommendations and to speak correctly to ACIP vaccination um, recommendations. A few additional pearls that I believe are essential to improving your vaccination rate are having the support from your leadership to create a culture that values immunizing. Life happens, so it's important to follow up with patients that we give immunization referrals to to ensure that they were able to get the vaccinations completed. It has to be a measured value, so make it a quality measure. In most of the meetings and work groups that I have attended, organizations stated that once they had transparency of immunization performance rates, their rates significantly improved. Lastly, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommends standing orders for several vaccines based on strong evidence of effectiveness in improving vaccination rates. The Immunization Action Coalition has developed templates of standing orders for vaccines that are routinely recommended to children and adults. They are updated annually and reviewed by vaccine experts at the CDC. You can find them at www.immunize.org under the Favorites tab as Standing Orders for Vaccination. Here is a list of a few other important resources that you can use to research information on improving your vaccination rates. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Green, and I'd like to thank each of the speakers for their excellent presentations. We will now have our question and answer section, and I ask that you enter your questions into the chat bar on the side of your screen or in the question section. Elizabeth Subcheck will read the questions and then direct them to the speakers. Thank you very much.
While we wait for the questions to come in, Dr. Green, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how you saw your rate increases improve over the course of time. Hi, yes. So we began this journey back in um, 2016 um, in regards to trying to increase our adult immunization rate. Um, since we began this journey, we have hit the um, Healthy People 2020 um, doctor goal for our adult population uh, based on that definition. And we are very close to hitting the pneumonia goal for um, Healthy People 2020. I think the thing that helped us the most was just bringing the awareness across the system and all of our um, clinics to providers and staff. And then, as I stated, um, the education. Education was a, a key component in us being able to improve those rates with helping to give the staff the um, information that they needed to be able to make the recommendations and also understand the ACIP recommendations for various vaccines that were required for our adult population. Um, we did partner with industry to help us with this education because we're a fairly large system. And so I would like to encourage um, anyone who's trying to complete education and your system is, is relatively large, don't hesitate to partner uh, with industry based on what your requirements are in terms of the information that you would allow them to share to help you reach um, your various clinics and areas that maybe your person that's assigned to this task wouldn't be able to reach um, in a given day. Thank you so much. Dr. O'Neill, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your experience with the use of mandates in long-term care facilities? Well, I certainly can. Uh, you know, as you know, it's, it has been a challenge, especially in post-acute and long-term care, uh, you know, with staff immunizations. Uh, we have great success with our residents. You know, they understand the importance of the vaccine and preventing influenza, pneumonia, serious illness. Uh, but uh, staff immunization has been a challenge, you know, and uh, across the country, uh, uh, you know, more and more organizations are looking at mandatory immunizations. But, you know, what we're recognizing is that we've got to overcome the barriers. One of the barriers, obviously, was financial, as Dr. Green alluded to, you know, the cost of the vaccine can be prohibitive for someone who uh, is experiencing you know, financial hardship and, you know, is trying to put food on the table and so forth. So I think it, it really is important if it's going to be mandated by an organization that uh, that the organization pay for the vaccine. And, and we are doing that in our organization. Uh, we're also making it readily available. We're having on-site clinics. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, proximity is not an issue. Um, we're making sure it's available uh, on clinics and even during the night shifts and on the weekends um, to, to make it accessible. Uh, a big part of it, and I'd love to hear Dr. Green's uh, response to this, is uh, overcoming some of the myths related to the vaccine, you know, that I'm going to get sick from it, uh, you know, the, some of the uh, false reports on autism being associated with the vaccine. Uh, but I think also, you know, one of the things that we've done, which I'm, I, I think is really helping significantly, is looking at the impact not only on the person who's getting the vaccine, but, you know, the risk if they don't get vaccinated, if they get the flu to their children, to their families, uh, to their co-workers, and of course, to the residents themselves. So um, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think, uh, you know, approaching it to address all those barriers can really help uh, improve our rates. And of course, you know, making it mandatory means you put some teeth into it, which means that, you know, you're basically letting those staff know that if they don't subscribe to it and don't have a good medical contraindication or, you know, significant religious uh, reason for it that uh, it means terminating their employment. Thank you for that response. Dr. McElhaney, I was wondering if um, you could talk a little bit about what you see as sort of the next frontier in improving vaccinations for older adults from a technology perspective. Um, you talked about targeting specific components for influenza virus, but are there other pieces that you feel are really exciting and developing um, as we speak? So I think that, you know, we've had um, different approaches to it. So I, I really, I actually want to come back to the virus thing because uh, this is really this whole targeting of 
those proteins inside of the virus and getting those killer that are necessary for stimulating those killer cells to clear virus from the lungs. That's really, I think, is a key thing to focus on for improved protection in older people. Um, and those, what's really important about those proteins is they stay the same across all of these different strains of influenza. So there is no need to produce a new vaccine uh, each year that targets those proteins. If they're in the vaccine, they will work no matter which strain it's from. So I think that's, and, and a lot of people don't realize that because the vaccine industry has mainly focused on antibody responses, which is what we use in younger people to talk about protection from the actual infection. In older people, when we're talking about clinical protection, those things that get rid of the virus once it's established in the lungs are really become important. And so the ways that the, the technologies that have been you know, sort of pursued in this regard are the things around increasing the dose of the virus that, and so you get more of those internal proteins in the vaccine um, or putting in an adjuvant that can somehow influence the direction of that response that I was talking about in terms of shifting it toward that um, interferon gamma production that also stimulates those CTLs much more effectively to come into the lungs and kill. So those are, that's where I think is the, the kind of the sweet spot on, on how we're um, trying to develop vaccines for older people. And, and what I want to do is distinguish this from what people are talking about in terms of universal vaccines, where they're trying to look at uh, what's been focused on is the antibody responses that are more cross-reactive across the different strains of, of the virus. Um, but it doesn't actually get to this whole thing that I'm talking about of killing virus-infected cells that becomes much more important for recovery uh, from influenza and avoiding those serious complications. Thank you for that comprehensive response. As a quick reminder, if you have any questions for our panelists, you can put them into the questions or the chat um, components of your sidebar and we'd be happy to answer them. While we wait, Dr. McElhaney, are there any other disease states aside from flu where you see some really exciting technology developments happening? Yeah, so I think, you know, this whole approach around the development of new pneumococcal vaccines that get, you know, sort of looking at what we've done with uh, um, pneumococcal uh, polysaccharide vaccines where we have extensive coverage of the strains but hasn't really contributed to eliminating the circulation of those from the population to what's happened with childhood uh, uh, conjugate vaccines that have basically eliminated these serotypes from circulation. And so how do we keep expanding um, the, the, the uh, serotypes that are emerging, particularly in older people, to offer protection against those that may not be as good uh, when we're using a polysaccharide vaccine for that purpose. Um, when it comes to um, uh, uh, shingles, vaccines against shingles, you saw in those recommendations that uh, were uh, put up for initially by Dr. O'Neill, um, the whole recommendation for the um, adjuvanted uh, vaccine called the Shingrix for the prevention of, uh, of shingles, a highly effective vaccine that capitalizes on this whole thing that I was talking about, about using um, adjuvants to really uh, promote a much greater cell-mediated immune response. Antibodies don't work against preventing shingles. It's the, that CTL uh, or, or T-cell response to that vaccine that is really um, has changed um, uh, the protective effects of the vaccine so that we see no age-related decline in its ability to prevent um, zoster in older people. And this is with over 90% um, efficacy, um, even into the older populations. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Very exciting times ahead, and we've got a lot of... I, you know, I, actually, you know what? One more thing just to think about, because we don't often look at what's emerging, but, you know, we've been... They, the industry has been trying to develop a, a, an RS vaccine, RSV vaccine for many years, and this was challenged by the, the early um, efforts to do this, um, you know, like probably 30 years ago, um, at the first attempt to do this where um, we didn't really understand what was going on and, and actually had enhanced uh, um, uh, disease in children with these vaccines. But now the newer technologies are coming out because when we look at impact of RSV as was shown in some of these things, like it's the next thing after influenza H3N2, even above the uh, flu vaccine that can prevent influenza B or it, it protect better against H1N1 strain. So I think that's a that's another area to watch because we've got vaccines that are going into trials, and I think that's the really the next frontier. Thank you. That's a great point. I think, Dr. O'Neill, yeah, go ahead. Elizabeth, I think it's. Out. Yeah, I was just going to say I think it's interesting that uh, you know we're seeing an emergence of H3 in the U.S. right now, and, and that. Um, this one is less susceptible to the vaccines that we've had than uh, the H1 uh, strain. So, uh, again, this is where having newer vaccines that can help us target these other strains is going to be very effective. Uh, we actually, there was just a national health advisory that went out uh, to uh, advise clinicians about anti-use of antiviral drugs uh, because of the emergence of the H3 strains. Great point. All right, so we'll turn it back over to you to close us out for the day. Okay, well, we're coming to the end of the hour, so we want to thank again our speakers and all of you for being with us today. Um, recording of this webinar is available, going to be made available very soon on the GSA, the Gerontologic Society of America's YouTube channel. Uh, you may also contact Elizabeth Subcheck with any other questions, so we want to thank you again and have a wonderful day.